this is another attempt to relate planetary nebula morphology and chemical evolution by way of gradients. Uh, it has been done with collaboration with Robert Montler, who is also here. Uh, I will say a few words first on Abundance gradients, just to complete what we just said. And then, number two, I will comment some recent results we have just published. And number three, I will do something that's more related to this particular conference, is trying to relate to the, the morphology that can be evolution in Abundance gradients. Especially, I will try to see whether or not there are differences between integrations of, uh, say, bipolar and non bipolar uh, Okay, uh, put it very simply, abundance gradients are just the variation of abundance with galact galactocyclic distance. So if you have this galaxy like ours, you see differences in the, in the abundance. And we would like to know the average magnitude of the gradients and also their space and time variations. And I will show you why. So these are examples of uh, uh, average gradients. This is for, say, Cephase and planetary nebula. This is also for Cephase, patient region and planetary nebula. As the just said, most people just try to fit a chart line. The gradient. So that's what we call the average gradient. But that's not the whole story. Because there are space variations. For instance, this is the previous work we have done on the planetary We have shown that the gradients try to uh, flatten out uh, at the uh, larger vacuum distances. The same thing we find in the surface. <coughs> we do some very good work like a one that we find any changes at all. But if you use uh, open clusters, these differences become very important. So apparently there is a flattening of the gradient as you go out in the galaxy. There are also uh, another kind of <coughs> near the sun, but I'm not going to discuss now. So time variation is also very interesting because uh, we would like to know whether or not the gradient changes with time. And so you can have an idea now why gradients are important. Because you can have the, the study the average magnitude, space variation, time variation. You have different chemical elements which tell different stories, and you can use different uh, <coughs> objects which tell also different stories. So the number of constraints that you have using a bonus radius is very large. And that's why when you study the most recent chemical evolution models, people are crazy about knowing what happens with the gradients because they will tell whether or not their model will be right. So we have some recent results that uh, I'm here. The most recent one is this one we have just published. We uh, uh, try to, scroll to to see whether or not there are differences between the gradients between in different uh, objects of different ages. So uh, this is a table from a uh, paper by Tajima a couple of years ago, just to show you that if you consider the, the classic paper of classification, you would expect different ages for the center of stars of planetary, uh, for the congenital stars of planetary level. So this is an average uh, estimate. And we have used this kind of uh, uh, classification in the past, but it does not work very well. Because we need something better than that, more detailed than that. This means that if you have a planetary, uh, this, this kind of mass here, you would expect it to be more than one given year ago. But we need more than that. We need individual ages. That's what we have been trying to do in the past couple of years. So we have developed several methods to come with individual ages, not average ages. So we have developed uh, basically five methods, which are based either based either on the abundances or on the kinematics of the planetary level and central structures. So here I'm concentrating concentrate only on these methods, uh, let's say one, three, and five which I believe now that are the best of the five. So if you are interested in those references that I just gave, you can see uh, the detail. What I, what I show here is just the average uh, age distribution that you get from these three methods. This is the number of fractional objects, and here is the age. I'm not sure you can read the numbers, but for method one, the peak is about four to five gigalitres. For method two, the peak is displaced slightly to the left, 
and from that the tree is pooping and displays the light. It means that this represents how, how poor is our knowledge of the, the real ages of the civil stars. So, for the moment, I have discussed most of the this method here, which I believe now is the most visible. But you can see that most of the, 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 the central stars that we of course, these three samples, these three distributions refer to the same sample, which is a sample containing about a 200 planetary nebula in the galactic list that we know best, better than any other nebula. <coughs> so, uh, we have applied this method for uh, different samples. Actually, method two was also applied to the, the planetary nebula in the winter, which we just presented back in the conference of Cambridge. And the basic procedure is like this. We just separate the, the sample in two different groups, old and young, and we define an average uh, uh, time different. Uh, we define uh, uh, what we call a, an age limit, and we calculate the gradients from all, all the groups. If you were lucky, uh, the, 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 the gradients, the difference between the gradients are not a function of the actual age limit, which is a very good thing. So this is an example from this uh, work that we have just published. Uh, so uh, this particular sample is the sample by Henry using the Henry Stegelin distance, just as an example. This is a very, very well-defined sample because it's very homogeneous. And here, in this particular plot, we have oxygen abundance as a function of the galactosetic distances. The blue is the old objects and the old and the red is the old, are the old objects using the major limit of 2.5 million. In this particular case, just an example, you see that there's essentially no difference between the gradients in this case. And if you look at the, at the right plot here, we have uh, the same sample, but here the, 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 the data are color code. So say the youngest is the youngest objects are 0 to 1 in a year, and the oldest was the high height of 5 million. So you see they are completely mixed in this particular and the average rate in this particular case is 0.03 times per parts. So, uh, we have two conclusions based on this one. The first conclusion that you can see from this plot is that uh, according to the age that we have calculated, we don't see much of a difference in the gradients for young or old particles. There is another uh, conclusion that I'm not showing you here, but I just mentioned that the younger have higher average abundances than the older. So that's a very good sign because the younger nebula have been formed out of the interstellar <coughs> medium. So they in principle should be more oxygen rich, more beer rich, more sulfur rich than they are. But the gradients are not very different according to these results. So now I come to the, the main topic here. Uh, what can we do uh, about the, the morphology? This is a less asymmetric planetary nebula medium. So uh, it's generally believed that the bipolar nebula are younger than the, the older, the round or elliptical nebula. So if that's true, and uh, most people I think believe that's true, but if the gradients change with time, so we should in principle to, to see some difference between the gradients from bipolars and the gradients from uh, non bipolars So we have done this, uh, actually. Uh, if you remember in the, in the previous APM meeting, you have just presented some classification with the Iceland the, the, the chemical differences between the symmetric and asymmetric, I'm not predicting that. The, just give you the two samples that I'm considering in this particular uh, uh, talk. Sample A is the our previous sample, it's a rather large one, 234 objects. And sample B is the sample by Henry, which I just mentioned. Since they use two different distance scales, this is kind of tau and this is kind of tau, this is the most recent one. So we have done the same calculation for both samples. Here I have used this standard sample uh, distances for this sample. And the, uh, since I need a reasonably large number of objects, uh, I have kept the classification very simple. Right? So it's round, elliptical, bipolar, proximate, or what classified. In particular, I will be interested in bipolars and low bipolars, which means uh, those that are not uh, uh, asymmetric. So that's what uh, the difference I want to see. 
So incidentally, if we, you feel like this is for metal blood, and remember metal blood is the one that uses the fundus in order to get the ages. So if you uh, plot the age the age distribution for these bipolars here, the blue bipolars here, you find something very interesting. Bipolars are common to the left, more than blue bipolars. Which means that that assumption that we have made that bipolars are young is probably true. So this is a very interesting result. And it confirms that our hypothesis from the right. So this is what we get. I don't expect you to, to read the, the, the table, but if you look at the red parts here, this is for some way for oxygen. But we have the same thing for new argon and sulfur. If you look at the bipolar level, you see that the average of both of these are higher than the low bipolars. So that confirms that uh, bipolars are younger, because they, you know, they are, and then they are from a lot of region to start meeting. But the grid is not very different, point of four and point of three in this particular case. So if you do that for the other sample, oh, this is the, the, just an example, this is the whole sample here, and this is just the bipolar in this particular case, this is the bipolar, you see that the grid is almost the same. Uh, this is uh, the same thing, but now it's asymmetric and symmetric. Just another way of seeing the same result, and you see that's not very different from the previous one. If you look at sample B, which is the one by Henry et al., you uh, get essentially the same result. So I'm not just giving you any this. Uh, it doesn't matter if you use the Henry et al. distances or the most recent division by Henry et al., you get essentially the same results. So this is another example using the SSP type of distance you know, to see that the radius are not very different. So we can get some conclusions of these things. Uh, the first conclusion is that the other groups always, all, almost always, have higher bonuses as, as expected. But the differences are small, but they are larger than the average circle. The second is uh, the bridges are similar within the circle. This work does not, uh, uh, it's not, it's not our goal to determine the average, the, the real rate. But we can have the, the, some kind of interval, which is 0.3, 0.7. And I'm convinced that the, the actual value of the grid depends strongly on the sound that we can see. So, uh, as you have noticed, no, no, no doubt, uh, all the samples are relatively small, even the largest sound. So I agree with you, uh, we need to guide distances in order to get this, put this in our another level. So this reinforces the conclusion that the average rate has approximately constant in the last 25 degrees. Why 25 degrees? Because that's the maximum age of the average uh, uh, age distribution that we have. But of course, uh, uh, middle migration and mixing the effect is just said that, and that's why I didn't include in this particular uh, study the type trees. All nebula, I didn't say that, but all nebula in this in this plot that I showed are type ones or two. I I was not able until now to get a real a reasonably large sample of type trees because the gradient, as she has shown, is probably small, but it's very hard to say if they were really, really small of this second uh, uh, consequence of radial migration. And uh, I have a uh, last few stories here which is opens another field for us. Uh, this is a plot from the very simple plot I gave to the Here is the abundance of the oxygen abundance of the radiant. It's zero here, it's here. As a photo of fresh. And uh, it, they have used different kinds of data and they have made hydrodynamical simulations using different chemical and motion models. And so they, depending on the model, you have different, uh, you get different results. Some of the results become, present something like very flat gradient here, doesn't change much of time. But others, I uh, don't know if you can see this, the, the, the red light, the green lines, the blue lines here, show that the gradient is much, more, much steeper in the past and becomes uh, uh, flatter now. And this has been recent, recently uh, supported by some recent data by Jones and Yuan. You can see here, these people have measured uh, the gradients in high-head shift galaxies, 1.5 to 2 
uh, redshift 1.5 to 2. And they found very strong gradients losing the gravitational, gravitational density. And if that's true, if that's confirmed, so you will have something, you will have, expect to have something like that. And uh, of course, for this particular paper, this particular talk, and what, everything I'm showing is notated more or less in this retirement here. Of course, it will depend on some kind of relation between the root back time and the rate and the redshift, which is shown here. Of course, it depends on the density parameter, but if you have this regime here, it doesn't make much of a difference. So, what I'm saying is that if you consider all this data on the planetary level that I'm presenting here, it, it goes up to about 0.5 redshift from 0 to 0.5, so that means it's a local universe. And in the local universe, what we find according to all models and the, the, the data is that the grid does not change that much. Yeah. So, the, the, the main problem is what happens before? What happened before? Where the, where the grid is like that or where the grid is like that? If you believe this recent paper by Johan uh, Jones, it goes like that. There are some points here and other points. So that's why I have it. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it's time for coffee. We'll come back here at 11.30.